Hi, Steve here, blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the in 2 Corinthians, verse by verse, and we're beginning chapter 12. We've only got two chapters left. Uh, I ask you to pray for the direction of this ministry. We don't know where we're going from here when we complete this study, but the Lord does. Uh, I believe today is September 23rd, the sixth year anniversary of the uh, Revelation 12 sign. And there are many believers around the world who believe this day to be to have some significance. Uh, I believe every day does uh, in, the, in the, the plan and the purpose of God. I thank you all for uh, hanging with us this past six years. We are all looking forward to our Lord's soon return. Uh, we here at Blessed Hope Forever pray for you constantly. You are on our mind constantly. We love you and we uh, think about you daily. We're going to begin our study in uh, uh, beginning uh, in or begin chapter 12 here. It's a very controversial subject. Uh, I ask you to bear with me. Uh, even pray for me as I go through this. Uh, it's a chapter, it's a subject that uh, in which we, uh, as believers, can encounter a lot of opposition. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very thankful uh, for just who you are and all you're doing in our lives. We're so very, very grateful for the opportunity that you give us to come together, to feast together on your word. We are so aware of our limitations. We, we depend on you to guide us and teach us. We know that you do. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is not of you, which is foolish, which is carnal, which is sealed to our hearts the truth of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So we go on with the 12th chapter. Uh, it is not expedient for me to boast, so I'll come to visions and revelations because that's the way others speak. Somebody had a, a vision that they ought to build a, a big uh, a super synagogue or something and, and hundreds of millions of dollars pile in. 14 years ago, I know a man who 14 years ago had an amazing experience, whether this experience happened in the body or out of the body, whether the man was dead or alive, I don't know, but he was caught up into the third heaven. I don't know whether he was in the third heaven, alive as a human being in a human body, or whether he was there as a spirit separate from a human body. I just don't know that. But he was in the third heaven, and there he heard things which is not lawful for a man to utter. Not lawful for a man to utter. Fourteen years ago. Now that would have got a lot of views on YouTube. I have to conclude from the beginning of the twelfth chapter here that nobody knew that. I guess, you know, maybe I, I'm reading into that more than I should, you know, but listen, at least hear me out. I don't think Timothy knew it, or Titus, or Barnabas, or any of the disciples at Jerusalem. Here was an experience of the Apostle Paul that 14 years ago, he hasn't even mentioned. That's just gotta be wrong, man. I mean, you know, you could advertise that and really get the crowd, put that on billboards, you know, whatever. This is the kind of thing that you want. Not only has Paul not talked about what he heard, he doesn't talk about what he heard here. And it's amazing to me as I read some of the commentaries and listen to some of the Bible studies, people try to surmise what he heard. Folks, I don't know what he heard. I don't know what the seven thunders uttered. I don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand. And it would seem to me that the very absence of any indication as to what it is 
is an indication by the Holy Spirit that that's not part of the message. So we don't have to waste our time surmising. I have no idea what Paul heard. Neither do I believe that there is, there is any benefit in us spending a, a whole lot of time trying to decide what he heard. We just don't know. We just don't know. He heard things that was not lawful to utter. To utter. You, had, you had a vision from the Lord, great. Okay, but just don't tell me. All right, it's not lawful for you to utter it. All right? The only thing that I know is that my Bible tells me if you had one, don't tell me because you don't have any right to even speak about it. 14 years now. That, that, that again seems to be in violent contrast with the operations that I see today. Somehow or other, we're departing from the genius of the Scriptures into a man-made uh, PR plan to push the cause of Christ as though we know how to do it better than the Holy Spirit. Why has this not been mentioned before? I assume the Holy Spirit made Paul write that he waited 14 years because we sure don't know much about it. What did he hear when he was caught up in heaven? And what's the thorn in his flesh? You know, probably if you don't study the Bible, you know that you know the thorn in his flesh was his eyesight, you know, because everybody seems to know that. I made a, a list the other night of some of the things that I've seen in the literature that were Paul's thorn in the flesh, and I come up with 54 things. 54. Now that seems to be an indication that, that maybe nobody really knows what it was. One of the, the most popular ideas, apparently today, I guess it's popular because everything in that area seems to be popular, is that he had a sexual problem. Now, I think it's clear that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to us that the reason for this revelation is not that we might speculate on what Paul heard or what happened to Paul, but that we might realize that Paul did not use this experience for personal gain. Listen to me, dearly beloved. Paul did not use this experience to push his own ministry He's kept quiet about it for 14 years. In fact, when it's presented here, I know a man. If you have the authorized version, the word know is oida, perfect knowledge, and it's in the present tense. I know a man who belonged to Christ more than 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body, I don't know. Uh, whether he was out of the body, I don't know. I don't know very much. I just know this happened. And I know the man heard things that's not lawful to utter. And there is not one peep out of Paul as to what he heard, what that revelation was, what the utterances were. Not one tiny indication. And it is clear from the revel uh, revelation that He's taking a disinterested position rather than saying, I'm that man. He says, I know a man. Now, I believe it's implicitly clear in the text that that man is Paul himself. It seems to me that he's obviously speaking of himself. Taking a disinterested position in this, in dealing with the subject of visions and revelations looking back at the 11th chapter apparently those who were, were preaching in Corinth had followed a course that was different from the course that Paul had followed you know they had pushed for money he had not he had he had taken nothing they had put a burden upon the people at Corinth he had not he had not been burdensome to them in any way, they had made great claims of being Hebrews and Israelites and sons of Abraham. Well, he was all of that. But he, but he didn't make a great claim to that. 
They had also made claims to their service. His service was was only incidentally referred to in the 11th chapter, and his ministry for Christ was one of a fugitive and a criminal. He was thrown in prison. Yeah, he was in shipwrecks. He was, he was running. He was fleeing. In fact, his ministry began by being snuck out of Damascus. You know, it's not, not the kind of grandeur and glory that, that we would associate with the king. Dearly beloved, when we went through 1 Corinthians in the 3rd and the 4th chapters, we looked at the earmarks of the true apostle and we found that in fact the true apostle was despised and rejected by the church system. That he was considered to be the offscouring of that system, that world system. That isn't what we labor for today. We try to make it grand we try to make it big and glorious and beautiful. We do it for gain and for promotion and for fame and in and, and, and influence, politics. Yeah. yeah, I said that. So we can have a voice in government. We are surrounded on every side by a grandeur that is contrary to the thesis of Christ. There was in God's ministry a burden that woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. A dispensation of that gospel has been placed upon me, and woe is me if I do not preach. And as we get into the 12th chapter, we're dealing with visions and revelations. And I'm going to suggest to you that apparently, this was also a part of the ministry of those who were burdening the believers at Corinth that they were laying claim to some special vision or special revelation. And that they were using those in the course of their ministry and their operation at Corinth. And here the Holy Spirit says this was also true of Paul, but never used. In fact, what he heard, he can't utter. He can't speak of. I think the first heaven is the is where the clouds are, the, the, where the birds fly, where the, the second heaven is where the stars are, the third heaven being where God is, wherever that is. And he was caught up into the third heaven. That, that is identified as paradise, which is the same word that Christ used when on the cross he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, if the general theological conclusion is correct, the righteous side of paradise was emptied when Christ rose from the dead, and so those who were in paradise are now with Christ where He is. Anyhow, that's where Paul went. And there he, he heard, he was able to hear, and it says that he heard words. So that what Paul heard was not some angelic language not some speech which he couldn't understand. The text clearly says that what he heard, he understood, but he was not allowed to speak of it. He could not come back and tell what he heard. I'm going to suggest that when the Word of God was complete, God no longer had any use for visions and revelations or dreams or, or anything else. And, and they are totally separated from any process of ours. Today, dearly beloved, as believers in Christ, you and I have been called by grace to trust Him. We trust Him because we have a complete revelation in His Word. And when we're interested in whatever God might have to say to us, it's in His Word. No longer by visions and revelations. It's interesting that Paul was over, well, he was over and over again delivered from danger. In, in the Philippian jail, the chains fell off, the doors flew open, he could, he could have walked out a free man as he sat there singing praises to God. But in later life, 
He was imprisoned and put to death in Rome. No doors were open. No chains fell off because the Holy Spirit through Paul had penned the last word of the revelation of God where there was no longer any need for visions and revelations. We have a complete revelation. I can't say that enough, folks. We have the, the Word of God is complete. We have everything that God intended to say, and when the Word of God was complete, those type of revelations ceased. There is no need for what he heard to be said for what Paul was doing by the leading of the Holy Spirit, not Paul's intelligence, not his mind, not his brilliance, nor his theology, but his pen. The Holy Spirit carried him along and directed what he should say. All right, we're not here to deify Paul, magnify Paul, or to bring great grandeur to his name. He was a tool used by the sovereign God to complete the revelation of God. And these kind of, of visions and revelations are unnecessary. What Paul heard in paradise, he was not permitted to speak. He couldn't come back and tell about it. Now, if Paul couldn't, you know, one wonders how others could. It seems apparent to me, you know, from the text, that there were those in Corinth that were doing that same thing. I'm certain that there are those today doing that. You know, they received some special re revelation, some special vision or dream or special commission, some special something from God. You know, and if you could just get a slight glimpse of the burden that they have received, then you would join wholeheartedly in the work, you know, the, or something like that. If Paul's not allowed to say it, how can anybody else say it? If you, if you have had such a vision and a revelation, surely the argument is still in effect that you also are not permitted to speak about it. That God is not going to tell you anything that you can come back and tell me. The lack of interest in God's Word overall adds weight to this very argument, folks. People long for some new revelation from God or some fresh experience to help relieve fears and anxiety. Some just want attention. Uh, some want to profit off these experiences in some way. Fame, fortune, I don't know. We don't exactly see Paul's actual trials, hardships, and experiences as welcoming. You know, Paul, our prototype. Verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. The only boast I would make is in my weakness. For if I should desire to boast, and that's a, that's a third class condition, I don't want to be foolish, for I speak the truth, and I'll endure, is the word, lest any man should think of me more than he ought to think, more than what he sees me or hears me to be. In other words, in the true minister of Christ, there is no push to make himself something. He really isn't. Not something to push himself ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ or in, in any way present himself to be something that he really isn't. Lest that should happen because of the abundance of the revelations that Paul had. I get the impression, and, and I only do that because of the word that's used there, that probably no other human, human, no other human had had any more revelations than Paul. Not Moses, not David, not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, but Paul. I see a, a mark in this verse of the jealousy of our God. Not jealousy in the way in which we use the word, for, for surely there's no sin with God 
but God guards His glory. It was not the process nor the intent of the Holy Spirit to bring glory to Paul. It was not God's intent to make Paul great, but to exalt Jesus Christ. You know, when God first spoke to Ananias in Damascus, after Paul's Damascus Road experience, God said to him, you know, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, that seems so contrary to human logic. You know, we, we start out with a bunch of, of presuppositions that God is great, God is mighty, God is powerful, God can do anything He wants to do. If God wants me to be His messenger, you know, just imagine how much that accrues to me and how much authority and power that I have. If someone says that they are speaking personally for the President of the United States, if he's an ambassador, you know, for the President, he appears with a certain amount of authority. Yet in the case of the ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, in which we're ambassadors for Christ, we're nothing. In fact, Paul points out that he's nothing in verse 11. You know, one of the most popular Bible teachers, I'm not going to mention his name, you know, running around the country today, is pointing out that a lot of Christians have gotten the idea that they're nothing and that's wrong. They need to see themselves as something. And, and, and I'm not sure I agree entirely with that thesis, folks. I believe it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is something. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Here, It is possible that because of Paul's carnality and the weakness of his flesh, that with all, with all of these revelations, he would have begun boasting of himself. He, he would push himself ahead of some other Christian. If you have had great revelation from God, it's not because you're better than others. It's because God is using you as a tool and you're nothing but a tool in the Master's hand. It is not the terror of God, the fear of God that would give Paul a thorn in the flesh. It is not the anger of God or the judgment of God, but the love of God that would make sure that his lowly messenger Paul would not be exalted above measure and would not lay boast and, and claim to some of these revelations which he had no right to do. You know, God could just, just have easily chosen Peter for this position or John or or somebody you and I never heard of. There surely was no constraint upon God to choose Paul, and yet not only did God choose Paul, He separated him from his mother's womb. And I believe every aspect in the, in the process of Paul's education and training was directed by the sovereignty of Almighty God. That Paul was a tool shaped and planned and prepared by the Master from the time that he was born until he completed the last word of God's revelation. And God could just as easily have, have done that with someone else. You, you cannot, folks, convince me that God saw something in Paul's mother's womb that said, well, you know, there's the baby. You know, I want to complete my revelation. There was no merit in Paul. No goodness in Paul. No greatness in Paul. Nothing in Paul. It was God and God alone who prepared him for the job that he had him do. So it appears to me that God's great love and concern for Paul shows forth in the verse lest Paul should get off track through the great abundance of the revelations that were given to him. And I read in that expression that Paul had received more revelation from God than any other human being. Any other human with, with the possible exception of Adam. More than Elijah, or Moses, or Abraham, or David, or Jeremiah, 
or Isaiah or, or any of the prophets or any of the apostles. Why? Because Paul was great? No, not at all. But because Paul was used greatly, and I want it clearly understood that God could have used anybody else. You know, the great humanist arguments today would argue that Paul was used because, well, Paul was used because he was willing to be used. You know, and I often smile at that. You know, he, well, he sure was willing. You know, after God kind of hit him with a, a bolt of lightning, struck him to his knees, took his eyesight away, led him into Damascus, made a, a coward out of him to sneak him over the wall, you know, in a basket. But his own argument in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians is that he preached the gospel against his will. I have to conclude in that context that Paul's life is one as a testimony to the sovereignty of God, not the willingness of Paul. And yet sermon after sermon after sermon preached to Christians is somehow to set Paul up as an example so that you ought to be like him. You ought to have the same willingness, the same zeal, the same desire to serve. When what we ought to see, what you, dearly beloved, what we ought to see is the operation of God in the life. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be willing, that you shouldn't have a, a desire to serve, not in the least. I, I am suggesting that any approach to the Scriptures that takes glory from Christ and puts it on man is wrong. And God in His great love gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him lest he should be exalted above measure. Three times I said to God, please take it away. And God said, the reason it's there is so that you might learn my grace is sufficient for you. And so I, I quit asking and I now boast in my weakness, not in my strength. And once again, I point out to you that it seems to me, if nothing else, that should, that should clearly indicate that we don't know what it was. Some believe it was another human. Some say it was Barnabas. Barnabas. I, of course, I, I know it was Peter. Folks, I don't know what it is. I, I don't see where we gain any value at all spending any time trying to discuss what it was, whether it was physical weakness, whether it was external pressure, or whether it was another individual. I don't know. I don't know. I do not know. What I do know is it was real to Paul. There are those who argue that obviously the Corinthians knew what this thorn in the flesh was. You know, bad eyesight, poor speech, you know, you know, bow-legged, short little Paul, you know, couldn't see over the pulpit or whatever. I, I don't know, folks, I don't know. I get the impression the way that this chapter began that the Corinthians didn't know what it was either. I don't think the Corinthians knew what it was for 14 years. Nobody had known that Paul was caught up into paradise. And nobody knew what the thorn in his flesh was. The human argument is that, you know, he was stoned, and when he was stoned, he died, and, and he was caught up, you know, he was resurrected, he was caught up into paradise, and, and then, or God resurrected him so that when he, he stood up, the disciples looked at him and they said, well, gee, you know, Paul, you're not dead. You know, and, and he never mentioned what happened. But now they knew. You know, because he couldn't talk anymore. The Greek indicates that he stuttered. And so one of the arguments is that one of those stones hit him in the jaw, hit him in the hit him in his beautiful oratory face. His his ability to speak was gone and and so he now stuttered. And that was the thorn in his flesh. I don't know that. 
surely that is the kind of thing that would be pushed today, no matter how you word it, dearly beloved, you're going to get some of the praise. Paul had never mentioned it. I conclude from the text that the Corinthians never even knew that he had a thorn in the flesh, that he was buffeted daily by something, and they, they never knew it. He never spoke about it. His responsibility, Paul's responsibility was the glory, the majesty, and the power of Jesus Christ. And if there's to be any boast at all in what the Holy Spirit is forcing me to do in this text, I'll boast in my weaknesses. I sought the Lord to take it away. He said, no, most gladly. Verse 9, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses, my, my infirmities. That is, in my weaknesses, in order that the power of the Christ might rest upon me. The weaker I am, the more Christ has to do. The better I am, the less Christ has to do. So, if there's going to be any boast in this at all, it's going to be in my weakness. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses. And boy, is that contrary to much of what I hear preached today. Well, Pastor Steve, uh, you know, somebody says, you know, I like listening to your sermons, but I do not believe that God wants us to suffer. Well, if you start out with that, that presupposition, you're going to build a whole theology on it. I believe that it is necessary for me to suffer if I'm ever to know anything of the grace, the love, the power, in the majesty of God. And I find that the inevitable result was not to argue with God nor to complain about the thorn in the flesh, whatever it might be, but rather to gladly, gladly glory or boast in my weaknesses in order that the power of grace might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in difficulties, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am made strong. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I am quite well aware of the fact that probably many of you out there, including some of our followers, our viewers, have had dreams and visions and revelations from God. And I don't know, well, you know. I'm not here to discount the experience that you had. What I am going to suggest is that you need to question the validity of it. This book, folks, is complete. I've said this, I've always said this, I'll, I'll keep saying this. I believe that if God himself was sitting right here, he wouldn't have anything to say to you that he hasn't already said in this book. Every single one of us as believers in Christ are on a level, an equal standing and a level playing field. Okay? He has not re re revealed any great revelation or any revelation of any kind to any one particular believer in the body of Christ over here in some corner of the world someplace where the, all the rest of the, of the body of Christ is deprived of any knowledge of it of, or any benefit of it from it, okay? That is just not how God works today. Of course, we don't want Him to... We don't want that to be true. We don't want that to be true. I think, you know, we as humans, homo sapiens in general, you know, just me as humans, we just, we get bored easy, okay? This is boring. Studying this book is boring. People would say. Nothing new, nothing fresh about it. I mean, you know, I mean, look, you know. Young Christian comes to the book, you know, well, scholars have been studying this for thousands of years. What, what am I going to come up with that's any, that's any different than what they have? And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 
You know, I'm not going to make any new discoveries. And you know, it is so easy, folks, to go down that path of new discovery into regions or realms that are not of the Holy Spirit. That's the lesson. I love you all. I truly do. Keep looking up. We're going home soon. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.